Hello, yes, okay. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the Researching Trans People's Marginalization and Resistance in Social Media. <clears throat> I'm Gina, these are my colleagues, Charlotte and Ash. Uh, we're gonna give a brief introduction of our research and, and then we're gonna look at some questions. We've devised four questions that will hopefully make our talks stimulating and interesting. Uh, we've realized that some of the questions are more applicable to different members of this team. Um, so I'll be dealing a lot with number one and, and so on. Um, yeah, so introductions. Well, I think I'm gonna pass this straight on, in fact, to Charlotte, because Charlotte's gonna give uh, basically a background of how we came together for this project on media and culture and a project called At the Digital Margins. So Charlotte. Introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Okay then. Okay, so hi, I'm Gina. Um, <laughs> I actually, my background is in literature, um, English literature and film at Edinburgh University. I've just finished a PhD. I started in 2016 when the world was very different and it seemed like trans was a big thing to celebrate. And by the end of my PhD, it was like I was living in a dystopia and I realized I had to focus on something, not just on the arts, but something darker, namely the media representations of trans people. And so that started my research at the end of last year focusing on media representation. So I'm not the most theoretical media scholar at the moment, I'm still learning. But that's what drew me towards Charlotte's research with Ash. And so we've uh, generally aligned um, well, very recently. And so that's my story, Charlotte. Thanks, Gina. Um, yeah, so we uh, met, um, or Gina and I met in the context of FGen and the uh, media and culture stream, cultural representation stream that um, Gina's chairing, I'm secretary, um, and we've kind of um, built this uh, group um, since last summer, so if you are doing media research, um, you're very welcome to um, get in touch and, and join that um, stream of FGen. Um, but we ended up um, putting together a project um, at the beginning of this year called At the Digital Margins, where we wanted to focus on um, this question of social media and um, the kind of relationship between social media and democratic uh, engagement um, and, and online abuse. And um, uh, so that's kind of where we came together. And then Ash, a colleague of mine, um, uh, has uh, has joined that team and we are hosting a couple of events uh, over the next um, couple of months. Um, so I'm a associate professor in German European politics and I came at this um, uh, through uh, research on the European public sphere uh, and then um, a lot of work on Brexit which took me to a lot of work on gender and populism. Um, and now uh, thinking about um, the impact of social media. Uh, so I'm gonna pass on to Ash and then I think we'll go back to Gina to, to start. Hello, um, I, as you will have learned, am Ash. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. Um, yeah, basically, Charlotte was like, we're doing this thing. You, you're, you're interested in, well, she knew what I was interested in. She knows I'm interested in um, feminism, trans studies, disability studies, all the good stuff, basically. And was like, do you want to be involved? And I was like, yes, yes, I most do want to be involved. Um, so I guess I'm kind of interdisciplinary gender studies um, and working in a politics department at the moment, which is really good, actually. Um, yeah, because I've sort of worked and studied in literature, French, and now politics, so all over the shop. But that, I think, is really good because it's allowed me to have particular tools from different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, and we basically need all the tools we can get, I think, especially at the moment. So, yeah, should we, should we move on to attacking these questions? I feel like, does anyone remember in Hercules where they all share the eye? Okay. Hi. Thank you. Okay, no, number one. So, how are trans people and allies represented in social media and legacy media? My focus is really legacy media, which for those who are not um, aware of this word, the UK national news me mainstream media. Um, 
So first of all, just to give you some background on how bad things are at the moment, you may al already be aware of this information, but for example, the Council of Europe um, published a report very recently on the vitri well, commenting on the vitriolic media campaigns in which trans women especially are vilified and misrepresented. Quote, ILGA Europe, anti-trans rhetoric continued to cause serious damage in the UK again this year, and they cite the intervention of a JK Rowling as being partly responsible for this. And so did actually Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Organization, which called out JK Rowling for helping to encourage this new kind of gender critical anti-trans uh, kind of rhetoric, to popularizing it. So um, why is this happening? Where has this come from um, connected to the media? Well, I think it's really interesting to look at some research carried out by Ipso basically looking at the whole 10 years um, of the 2010s. Um, and what they noted was um, in the first half of the decade, the media was really focusing on lifestyle stories about trans people. But then as GRA reform reared its head, suddenly you had these journalists with no background in um, policy making, suddenly writing about the minutia of trans policy. And so basically what happened is self-identification became this term and I, I kind of liken it to a Rorschach test where the journalistic class of, of Britain as well as the gender crit movement I think basically looked at this thing and poured all the most terrible fears into this word and that's what it became and that's and that became the news agenda um, just a, a quote to, to kind of confirm how things change in this intensification of media coverage from Ipso during the second half of the 2010s, the number of stories reached an average of 176 per month, a rise of 414%, and an indication of the dr dramatic emergence of transgender-related stories in the press. Um, and yes, and there was the shift towards policy making, which people who write in, in the media didn't really understand, because it's a very elitist industry. Okay, so. What has been um, the, the outcome of this? We've seen news stories um, which have become very fearful uh, about trans people. A really good example, I think, is Janice Turner in the, in the Times. Um, I've looked, I've done like discourse analysis of, of her articles. And the reason I pick out Janice Turner, she's one of the most respected award-winning columnists in Britain. And so here's from, from one article, I, I picked out key words likely to vilify trans people um, and really associate trans people with abuse, which is kind of connected to the, the work of my colleagues in, in as much as trans people are always the abusers, never the abused. So here, here's just like a, a list of, of, of lexical uh, phrases and words from one of her articles. This is the woke left is the new ministry of truth. This is really focusing on, on trans people. So. Woke left, ministry of truth, silenced, Orwellian nightmare, tyrannical minority, Korea assassination, angry throng, seditious vocabulary, heretical thoughts, terrified, science denial, double think, wrong speak, catastrophic collapse of free expression, vicious censure, unspeakable, frightened for their own livelihoods, social media pylons, censorious peers and aggressively picketed, this is what award-winning journalism in Britain looks like now, describing trans people. So it's no wonder that you've got this. This is the mainstream, and it's basically describing trans people as kind of fascism. Um, sorry, to keep, yeah, so trans people are basically treated as kind of the abusers and the oppressors. This, this common narrative, in fact, in the media, where the powerless people are portrayed as the most powerful, and the powerful are portrayed as the least powerful. And it's done this flick. Um, it doesn't just happen um, with key words like this, though. I think I've really become interested in the use of a mission. So with a mission, medias, um, the British legacy media, they tend to cut out key, um, key information to also portray trans people in particular ways. I think a really good example of this was with the JK Rowling essay. Um, and this is, um, the Guardian is a very good example. The way that they use the omission of information to make trans people look irrational. We've looked at binaries today. Um, so all kinds of binaries from Julia Serrano, among others. And the binary that's definitely set up from the JK Rowling furore is 
um, anti-trans or JK Rowling is um, rational and trans people are anti uh, irrational. So like a good example, um, three articles between August to October by Alison Flood in The Guardian, and these were news stories, these were not columns, um, they all cite the words sex is real as being the problem, being at the core of the, the anger of transgender people. Um, and I've tried looking at all the kind of the main trans social commentators or charities finding this anger at the phrase sex is real and I couldn't find it. I looked for example at this famous uh, open letter by mermaids um, and they don't say anything about sex is real, they, they say this and I'll quote what mermaids said in their critique of the JK Rowling essay. We do not consider it a crime for women to express concern. We do, however, consider it abusive and damaging when people conflate trans women with male sexual predators, impute sexual criminality to trans identities, suggest that, su that support of a trans child is parental homophobia and misogyny, and share uncorroborated information which severely damages the lives of trans and non-binary people. And especially this word predator comes back a lot in, in recurring critiques of what Rowling did. The media don't mention this word predator, they mention sex is real. Um, throughout all three of the articles by Alison Flood, for example. So it's, it's by this omission of all the things that Rowling said, and just focusing on, on her experience of domestic abuse, it really frames trans people as, as crazy, basically. So there are different ways of framing trans people. You can go the Janice Turner route, or the Janice Turner overdrive, as they call it, of just loading up loads and loads of, of really negative words, or you can just curate words very carefully to make trans people look like they're overreacting over nothing. Um, and this leads me to the Stonewall uh, kind of side of my focus. How am I doing for time? Is that okay? Okay, good. So I really kind of went on a diversion with Stonewall. This isn't really about abuse in, in the kind of conventional sense. Abuse being the cruel and violent treatment of a person. This is the media going after an entire organization to get at trans people. There's been, as some of you may be aware, a campaign against Stonewall in the media to basically destroy Stonewall, it looks like. Um, I've got some data which I think will, will back that up. So. Um, this coordinated campaign, it wasn't just the media, in fact, it, ha it could have arguably have started in social media. I'm going to quote from Gabby Hinsliff in The New Statesman. There was, okay, coordinated campaign via feminist blogs or threads on parenting site Mumsnet under the hashtag don't submit to so Stonewall. In the first quarter of 2021 alone, around 900 freedom of information requests were made to organizations that Stonewall works with. So this attempt online already to undermine Stonewall and tie them up so badly and demoralize them so badly that they wouldn't be able to function. While this was happening, the, the legacy media went for Stonewall. So I've looked at, I, I used uh, Nexus, a uh, re research program to, to look at some stats. So in the last two years, um, I've looked at four newspapers. The Eye, by far the most pro-trans newspaper in Britain. Uh, 24 stories featured on Stonewall, two centered on Stonewall primarily, and both of them were positive. The Independent, 94 stories, six centered on Stonewall, five of them positive. The Guardian Observer, 72 stories um, with eight um, centered on Stonewall, six of them negative, two positive. So, the Guardian and Observer broadly kind of reproducing the right-wing media's anti-Stonewall kind of focus, but in a, in, a, in a less frequent way. And then finally, the Times, Sunday Times, 178 stories featured, 48 centering Stonewall, 47 negative. And I, the, the range of attacks from the Times and Sunday Times is so great. I made a top 20 themes. And what's interesting about these themes, it really correlates with broader critiques of how the media vilifies and demonizes uh, marginalized groups. I know Nezreen Malik has, has written very, very well about um, th this free speech crisis, um, this confected free speech crisis done by the, the media. Meanwhile, you've got people like Alison Phipps writing about how um, this predator narrative against certain marginalized identities of needing to protect white, implicitly white women and children. So both of these appear a lot, but I'm gonna read out the key themes um, that, that emerge in the Times coverage. Number one, 
Withdrawal by organizations from Stonewall Workplace Program 33 times. That becomes a theme in their stories, almost as if to encourage a mass exodus um, of organizations from Stonewall and effectively destroy them. Number two, Stonewall undermines free speech, 26. Times Stonewall represents institutional capture and lobbying, 24 times. Um, I'll just read a couple more. Stonewall is a waste of money or a racket, 18 times. And Stonewall is dominated by dogma or gender ideology. This is something, of course, Vladimir Putin is the kind of thing that right wing people kind of push. Then we've got children's welfare, misinterpreting the law, based on one report by Aqua Reindorf, which basically became the dodgy, dodgy dossier to really attack Stonewall. Um, I say dodgy dossier. If you go on the Trans Legal Project and read their report on Aqua Reindorf's report of Stonewall, and see the flaws in Reindorf's report. I think it's really interesting the way the media just ran with his report to bash Stonewall. So this isn't individual abuse, but this is um, newspapers like the Sunday Times, the broadsheets going after Stonewall, clearly with a campaign um, to try and undermine them as badly as possible. How am I doing for time? Okay, now that just leads me on to a final thing, which is The Guardian. I think I'm, I'm really interested in The Guardian because I've been a Guardian reader all my life, and it's a Britain's number one progressive newspaper in terms of readership. And so reading one Guardian article about their coverage about Stonewall has been really interesting in bringing together all these, these themes. So the Guardian, um, as I think I've mentioned, they, they've, writ they've written about Stonewall generally negatively, and they produced a, one particular article. Stonewall is at center of toxic debate on trans rights and gender identity. And this is by their legal affairs correspondent. It wasn't a column, but I looked at the key words. Toxic, four times, comes up in the article. Extremist, three times. Aggressive, twice. Controversy, twice. And synonyms like fraught, polarized, and storm. Always trying to make these, these words kind of associated to Stonewall, as, as the rest of the media are doing. And there was one particular passage that um, kind of jumped out at me. Um, each controversy has been linked directly or indirectly to its position on trans rights, which critics believe is over-aggressive and seeks to shut down debate, out of which the charity and its defenders believe is putting it on the right side of history. And just following that, it, it mentions Jermaine Greer and Julie Bindle, both raised concerns about predatory men gaining access to women's spaces. So you've got Bindle and Greer described simply as they've just raised concerns, and you've got Stonewall, this LGBT charity, portrayed with the words over-aggressive and trying to shut down. This is incredible, and this brings in the issue of omission of facts. If you look at the history of Jermaine Greer and Julie Bindle talking about trans people, this is kind of gaslighting because lots of trans people and allies will know the kind of things that have been said, um, I'm going to quote, so trigger warning, this is like bad transphobia, but this is Greer, um, 1989 in The Independent. I should have said, this is to a trans woman, you're a man, the female eunuch has done less than nothing for you, piss off. The transvestite held me in a rapist's grip, dot, 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 gross, gross parody of my sex. This is kind of typical for Greer, but in The Guardian, she gets described as merely having raised concerns. Bindle, say, Bindle's in The Guardian with these columns. Like, this newspaper journalist could easily have just researched his own paper and found the 2006 article, 2004 article, etc., by Bindle to kind of highlight just how problematic their position on trans is. But their transphobia gets whitewashed, and instead we get this portrayal of Stonewall as this evil or suddenly over-aggressive organization. So you see this combination of vocabulary and omission of facts to basically show trans people uh, as irrational or abusive and organizations which, which support trans people equally as kind of abusive and, and aggressive and trying to clamp down on free speech. Meanwhile, people who are anti-trans get away with murder. So that's my research uh, at the moment, so thank you. Thanks, Gina. Um, so I was, um, I wanted to kind of focus more on our kind of second question and think about what are the implications here for political engagement and, and democracy. And I, I came at this last summer um, when I was writing a article for a special issue on social media and, and engagement with European politics. Um, and it ended up 
being quite a long rant, essentially, um, uh, about kind of, I was reading the kind of mainstream political science literature on social media uh, as a digital public sphere, uh, as a space for uh, opinion formation, for, for uh, collective action, for kind of new forms of um, participation, of democratic deliberation. Um, and thinking about this idea of omission, um, while recognizing that um, social media brings a potentially damaging impact of filter bubbles, um, echo chambers, um, a lot of this literature has, has not addressed the um, experiences of, of marginalized groups uh, on social media. And, and here we're kind of thinking about what are the implications of social media for trans and non-binary people. Um, so I um, was thinking about this kind of concept of the public sphere and looking at um, feminist uh, theory and intersectional theory to try and understand how we can conceptualize um, the impact of social media uh, on democratic engagement that takes into account um, these intersectional dynamics. Um, and so I, I have a couple of areas that I've been thinking about. Firstly, the um, impact of um, online abuse um, and also the, the kind of potentially positive impacts of social media for um, the development of development of subaltern counter publics. So kind of allowing marginalized, traditionally marginalized groups to um, uh, mobilize politically informed communities. Um, so we know from um, kind of public debates, there's increasing attention to the role of um, social media and kind of facilitating online abuse. Um, uh, and if um, I'm kind of reading um, Nancy Fraser's work on, on the public sphere and um, the way in which um, particular people, women, um, people of color, trans people are um, ignored or silenced or dismissed in particular ways in democratic debate. Um, and so what we've seen obviously on social media is um, that, um, and there have been a lot of um, high profile women MPs, for example, who have spoken out about the um, constant onslaught of um, sexually violent messages um, that they receive via um, Twitter, rape threats, death threats. Um, and so thinking about actually Julia Serrano's talk this morning, this very much highlights the sexualization of uh, women in public life. Um, but what we then uh, see if we take an intersectional approach is that trans and non-binary people experience um, as part of this, the trans transphobic or trans misogynistic manifestation of that sexualization. Um, these dynamics are then worsened by kind of structural intersectionality that limits access to people's um, to police, for example, when it comes to the most serious messages, but also action from uh, social platforms and um, in terms of legislation. Um, but my argument is, is then that this is not just about, or we, we shouldn't just think about this in terms of individualized acts of online abuse, but as a kind of more systematic exclusion of certain bodies from democratic de debate as forms of um, different forms of silencing so this this might be kind of a, a very like like obvious form of silencing of, of um, uh, um, crowding out particular voices or shutting up particular voices but also that transforms into um, a self-censorship um, and I think we we heard a little bit about that in the discussion um, with Natasha's talk earlier about um, how far trans people are included in particular spaces, but also how far trans people trust um, that they're safe in particular spaces. Um, but then the other side is that social media has actually opened up um, these um, kind of new opportunities um, to create what Nancy Fraser would describe as subaltern counter publics. Um, uh, and there's um, kind of idea that we can have feminist filter bubbles. And I think Sarah was kind of talking earlier about um, the importance of creating those kind of safe spaces to um, to have community and to uh, mobilize. Um, and so, and I think Sean Fayez talks about this in her book that, um, that, that social media has been revolutionary for uh, trans people to have voice and um, for, uh, build community. Um, uh, and, and to kind of, uh, that, that these, that, 
there, there is that aspect of social media that creates these that offers these tools for mobilization that allow um, put those ideas to feed into the mainstream. Um, but what we also do need to, uh, the flip side of that is that there are then, of course, um, intersectional, other forms of intersectional marginalization that can take place in, in, um, in particular subaltern spaces, um, uh, whether that's um, uh, in whether spaces become kind of white feminist spaces or uh, trans exclusionary uh, feminist spaces or ableist um, spaces. Um, we're also um, limited here by the kind of structural um, dimensions of social media platforms and algorithms um, in terms of how far um, the kind of account deletions or suspending of accounts uh, is um, targeted more frequently at um, marginalized uh, groups and accounts. And we saw actually Transmedia Watch, I think, had their um, Twitter account suspended um, just last week. Um, and then things like shadow bans and um, demoting of content. Um, so ultimately, uh, my kind of answer to this question is that we, when we think about social media, um, we need to think not just about the kind of uh, negative uh, aspects in terms of the individual, but also about um, democracy and kind of and, and inequalities in terms of accessing democratic debates. So I'm going to pass over to Ash now. Yeah, this is pretty much where I come in. Um, so Charlotte wrote this really excellent article that was asking us to think about social media in intersectional terms. Um, there's lots of brilliant trans and feminist and trans feminist work on social media and kind of what it does um, and its negative impacts. Um, I wanted to think about how. Um, and I was thinking about how in terms of affect. Right. So there's a link to the keynote this afternoon from Dr. Bay. Um, because like how, so we know, right, if there is hostile, offensive harassment, if there is nonsense, if there is, if there are things you don't want to engage with, there is going to be a drawing back. I thought, right, okay, how can we actually think about this? How can we actually analyze this in more depth than there's horrible stuff on the internet and understandably people don't want to deal with it. Um, so I've been very kind of tentatively thinking about um, two effective models um, which have an impact on political engagement on social media. So the first of these I've kind of situated in response to direct harassment. So this is some of the things both Charlotte and Gina have been talking about right so when you are engaged on twitter or by legacy media and you are receiving harassment yourself personally um so this could be a repetition of kind of phrases like you know having someone tweet a hashtag like sex is real or adult human <clears throat> chinchilla whatever it is at you sorry always always go for the joke i can't help it um but yeah it can, we can have direct harassment and what happens there so we might have anger sadness frustration how do people process this in different ways so you might either have i would argue a kind of obligatory disengagement so either through things like official bans or just genuinely not being able to deal with it um you can't be in that particular space because it is toxic it is unhelpful so you have to take yourself out of it and then i thought about kind of strategic disengagement as well right so you maybe you think okay i'm not going to deal with it today or i'm not going to deal with it this afternoon but 
I'm not totally blocking myself off from it. Or you might think, okay, I will deal partially with this space, but I'll only deal with it in certain ways. Or it might be, I'm not going to deal with Twitter, and this is kind of an approach I take, I'm not going to deal with Twitter, but it doesn't mean I'm going to take myself out of all of these conversations. Um, so direct harassment is its own kind of specific thing with its own particular problems. And I also wanted to think about kind of indirect harassment. Right? So when you are witnessing a type of abuse or harassment or a series of insults that is directed at a marginalized or multiply marginalized person with whom you share at least one aspect of marginalization. What happens there? What kind of effects come up? You know, is there sor solidarity? Is there anger, sadness, fear, frustration, exhaustion? Is there a mix of all of them? Um, yeah, I think so. But I think we have this, we have this, particularly in the UK, we have this discourse at the moment of this kind of the snowflake, the woke left, the becoming a problem um, in Sarah Ahmed's frame, right? So that then triggers a further dynamic when people are harassed indirectly. Um, or witness indirect harassment, because you almost expect that if you say, look, I don't want to deal with this, you almost expect to be, be positioned as someone who is overly sensitive, too much of a snowflake, needs to grow a spine, this, that, and the other. So you're creating this kind of drama in your head as a result of all the times that insult that discourse has been thrown at you. Uh, yeah, so I'm basically just talking about those models, trying to develop them, see what happens with them, because I think it might be kind of a useful way of examining those processes. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of leads on to silencing, right? That's most of silencing covered. Want to have a chat about activism now, anyone? Or should we open the floor, yeah? All right, floor, hello. Uh, there's a question at the front. I don't know how we're going to do microphones. Can someone do the microphone? Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm Natalie Sheha. So speaking of silencing, uh, as you know, like uh, there's unfortunately a recent thing that like a controversy that has clashed with this conference so well all i'm feeling about like silencing in terms of like trans people and trans rights is that like uh what i feel like is that cis people's thing uh usually takes priority over like uh trans stuff and especially for trans right or like uh there is some kind of like disregard of the like urgency of uh especially like how things have been like accelerating so quickly and like just kind of like we can't cope or even to the point that some people might feel unsafe but like uh there's like a lack of empathy and solidarity on this like uh allies of the cis side of things so how do you like address that <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry, I mean, I don't know who should take this question. Not I don't know, but I mean, to be fair, I, I don't know. Because it, it, is, it is quite difficult. Um, do you want to go first and I'll come back or do you want me to go first? Yeah, process time. Process time is a thing, right? So, yeah, now, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's, I think, I, I think we need tools to, I think one of the things that we need to think about with social media is how do we respond to um, instances of kind of pylons or um, 
uh, kind of targeted abuse. And um, so, I mean, I actually started thinking about um, this issue when I was, um, I ended up being the target of a Daily Express article <laughs> uh, after speaking about Brexit. Um, and you can imagine the kind of things that their readers had to say in the comments. Um, but I was really struck by how, like, most people around me kind of um, said, kind of the main advice I got was don't read the comments. We've talked about yeah. this, right? Um, uh, or if you get into the Daily Express, you know you're doing something right. Um, and the, the idea that you can kind of just not read the comments is um, really completely misunderstanding like that experience. Um, and I did read the comments um, and I, so I, so kind of what I'm trying to say is that we, I think people don't really know how to respond when these things happen and that what actually, uh, what I have seen on the flip side is knowing kind of some feminist scholars also writing uh, about Brexit who uh, got some, some particularly nasty instances of Twitter pylons is some um, particularly kind of good male colleagues kind of used the hashtags to repopulate the hashtag with kind of supportive messages, um, which kind of enables you to kind of take back the um, kind of, yeah, take back the mic a little bit and also to signal back to the institutions that we're working at that, that we're not just getting kind of negative responses. So I think on, in one sense, there's a question about how do we build up different tools um, uh, in our networks for, for responding to these that go beyond simply just telling people not, not to deal with them, not to read them. Um, Gina or Ash, do you want yeah. Yeah, um, this is still a bit unformulated, so apologies for that. Um, I think there are, there really are um, cis people, particularly marginalised cis people who do show up for us um, all the time. And it's easy for their voices to get lost because we that, that there is there are a rel there is a relatively small minority of quite powerful voices particularly in the uk that have access to the media um and that's that's what we hear right we hear these gender critical voices again we hear these um conservative and far right leaning voices and because they have power because they're so dominant the cis people who are showing up for us don't always get heard, but they are there. Um, okay, sometimes it doesn't, it feels like um, we, we need their support more. Uh, and it will vary from space to space and person to person. But I have really, oh gosh, um, this is so mushy. But I, I suppose again, the links to the earlier keynote, right? I have really taken comfort in the fact that I do have, <laughs> I was joking about this earlier, I do have cis friends who have been absolutely fantastic. I really do. Um, and it, it, yeah, I've, I've taken comfort in that. And I guess to go on, to, uh, to go back to what Charlotte was saying about tools, I guess it's about trying to find tools to support each other because there are, you know, there are, ex there are oppressions that I don't uh, experience at all. Um, and I want to try and show up for my friends who are marginalized along those axes um, and learn what to do. And I think cis people can do that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just want to like ask one more thing like uh, after like uh, my question. So I just want to clarify. So what's been happening is that like uh, I feel like uh, the sits kind of like events like uh, I understand they might have like the right to fight for or something but like uh, should we concede or should we like uh, give way if there is like a clash it's not like a clash of interest it's more like you know 
probably timings or like uh, whatever reasons, but like uh, the trans stuff are like more urgent because like theirs is not like life threatening. You know what I mean? I can answer, but I can't, because I'm focusing more on the media, I can't talk about um, social media related things. I can talk about this issue of silencing and how to respond to it. Um, so to, in terms of dealing with the media, and I'm a hypocrite because I still read The Guardian, and um, it does, within the monolith um, that, that looks like it's completely transphobic, I mean, there are some amazing journalists, Libby Brooks, fantastic journalist, fact-checking journalist um, of The Guardian, does a great job of covering trans. So cis journalists who are sympathetic to trans people, they exist as well. I think the problem is at, at the top level, I suppose. Um, I, I have to recommend Navara Media, uh, amazing, like I think it's three times a week on YouTube, um, with Ash Saka, one of the most erudite and brilliant kind of analysts of the current moral panic against trans people and she's a cis ally. The Owen Jones uh, YouTube uh, channel has amazing kind of speakers, brings on tra you know, informed trans people from Ros Cavani um, to, to many others to talk about and give the trans side of things. So there are, you know, it's, it's possible to get overwhelmed and think there's no hope. And cis people, they're all evil. <laughs> but there's loads of brilliant cis allies out there and it's about not being overwhelmed by the darkness. Uh, generally kind of constructed by the editorial line and the, and the proprietors, I suppose. Um, so I guess from my side, it's, it's finding where the, the, the cis voices exist, and there are many, and they are, they are brilliant, and they, are, they love trans people, and for me, that's, that's a way of dealing with it. So I, I totally, I certainly haven't given up on, on cis people, and of course, um, I have many cis friends and so on. So, um, but yeah, even in the media, there, there are there are newspapers like The Eye and there's Navara Media, which is amazing. So I do recommend not getting too overwhelmed, but kind of looking out there for the places where cis allies definitely exist and they control the output as well. And it's, it's amazing to watch a news program um, be pro-trans. It's, it's, it's both shocking and wonderful. So these places do exist. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I would just say that I, I, this is what I've really loved about um, FGen is that um, kind of a um, kind of a, attempt to build kind of solidarity coalition that that is explicitly a feminist coalition that takes the, the position that that feminism has to be trans inclusive and and I think these kinds of organisations and these kind of events are really important for for bringing. Um, cis and, and trans feminists together and, and we need to do more of that. Um, I think we only have a few minutes left, um, but there are a couple of hands here. I don't should we collect a couple of points and then so perhaps the, these two here? And, and there's someone waving at the back. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I have a um, question from Melissa Stephanie online. Um, it says, Charlie, Charlotte mentioned algorithms. In an era of post-truth, particularly on social and political media, could the panel comment on this a bit? A recent report from Logic, Logic Cully showed how the hashtag keep prison single sex was elevated through bot networks and fake profiles and this worked to give the impression that they are a popular viewpoint with the knock-on effect that despite its relative nicheness and false campaign it creates the impression that it's rooted in fact how can we challenge this when show social media giants like twitter refuse any accountability Um, should we take the next couple of comments and then we'll come back to try to address as many as we can in the last few minutes? Hi, um, my name's Helen. I am a cis ally who works on social media, probably follow quite a few of you. Um, actually, just in answer to that question um, about the algorithms, I happen to know that Trans Safety um, Network, they actually did a piece of work where they showed up how the algorithms are exploited with a hashtag called I am an exploit, 
um, which highlighted how the bots worked, or how not just bots worked, but how individuals worked by having a small number of people who elevated a particular hashtag. Just with regards to social media, when there is negative hashtags that go uh, out there, one way that you can counter that is one by point, uh, posting positive messages using a hashtag, but also introducing a new hashtag into the discourse in order to swap the um, swap onto that new hashtag to withdraw the, co the concentration and the attention span away from the negative um, hashtag. Um, I'm very interested as well um, through looking into this. Um, studying this for a number of years actually in a similar field is how the offline media actually intersects with the the digital and the social media and how actually certain articles are written almost explicitly with the intention to be shared on social media and to capture attention and the headlines in particular are written in a very inflammatory way and in many instances don't necessarily have any great bearing on what the story is or if they do, that they kind of overemphasize in a very negative way one small aspect. And again, one tip that I have, would suggest anybody use, because what they're trying to do is hijack your attention. Um, and it's based a lot of the times as well on hijacking your attention in order to get advertising revenue. Is if you are going to share anything, is to make sure that you archive the news articles first and you share the archive, and that way you're not giving any money to the advertisers and you're not giving clicks to that particular news platform and that's way, one way that you can actually withdraw the monetization away from the negative stories and similarly when there is positive news stories is to actively click on those so that anyone who's looking at the analysis and the, of the stories themselves will show that there is a lot of engagement with positive news stories my last um, point is I just want to say, as a CIS ally and, from, and looking into this, there is a huge amount of support. All of the research shows that the majority of women particularly are supportive of trans people. When you see any of the research that goes on, it is not representative of what is happening in the newspaper, in the mainstream newspaper, and it is not representative of what's happening in little uh, social media bubbles, the majority of people are supportive of trans people and I want trans people to feel emboldened and empowered by that, that you know, the, the media is not representative of the world at large. And then the person here, we have to wrap up, so if you could keep it really, really short. I'll try my best uh, to add a more transnational perspective. I'm really gr grateful to be here because I can learn a lot from your research and hopefully apply it in my country. I come from North Macedonia, where we also have the same transphobic narratives. And I think it, we can, uh, in a way, compare this kind of uh, situation in, a, in a creating better ways of responding to it. So if I may add also to your point uh, that that perspective was also used in how we address some of the transphobic uh, narrative, in, specifically in so social media, to go back in the spades uh, perspective of mutual aid, creating those informal networks of support was really a success for us, how to address those things. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and I have two specific questions because specifically in Macedonia, the problem that we had that these transphobic narratives were directly sponsored by the government. So my question is, well, we speak about media, how firm can we make the connection that the media is a servant to the current government? That's my first question. And my second one is a bit broader, but let's try to address it in our future. Uh, how do we create strategic approach uh, in creating a response to this kind of narrative? Because we speak about this kind of informal solidarity networks and all those things, but let's think in a bigger term of a strategic approach of that, those. Thank you. Um, we're way over time, so I'm not sure if we uh, should we finish or each like have like a minute to. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, <laughs> how, okay. Let me go to that final question. Um, how to show the media is serving up the government, for example? I mean, in definitely in Britain, we have this research. Um, the Sutton report, for example, has shown just how elitist the media is. Um, something like, my gosh, 44% of columnists went to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, 
90, although 93% roughly of British people went to a comprehensive school, only something like it's less than 20% um, work in the media. So there's plenty of statistics that show the, the UK media is very elitist, establishmentarian, and it protects status quo. And um, the statistics back this up, and I'm sh maybe it's the same as well in Macedonia and, it, and in North America, indeed. So these statistics exist in these kind of sociological surveys. Um, and so, yeah, it's a revolving door in Britain. I mean, my God, Boris Johnson, right? He's a journalist from The Telegraph, I think, um, among other newspapers. So they all know each other. They all go to the same parties. They all talk about the same kind of things. And they have the same concerns, which is why they never talk about housing, a housing crisis, for example. Um, so we know that it's elitist in Britain, too, unfortunately. And how do you get around this? I think the expectation is, just to kind of give a long-term solution, um, the, the UK legacy media is kind of year on year, it's, it's doing worse, it's losing more and more of its, of its market, that hopefully someday it will just be so, the, the population reading it um, and, re and using that media will be so small that it will lose its influence. That's, I know that's a small thing to hold on to, but that is the trend as well, which is a good thing. Sorry. I think that comes back to the question of social media and that that's kind of the one benefit of social media that, that allows us to circumvent um, the, the kind of those institutions of media power um, and create new forms of, of media. Um, but I think the, the question, the point about the interconnections between the legacy media and the, and the offline media is really important and we actually can't see them as completely separate because because of this crisis in newspaper ownership um we that the, the legacy media and especially the tabloids have developed very good strategies for how to use social media as part of their business model um ash one minute and then <laughs> Damn. okay um yeah i guess commercial interests there right um and how that taps into what the government's interests are or may be as well, um, whether that's in terms of getting themselves clicks, getting themselves more subscriptions, getting themselves voted in. Um, yeah, and I guess just... <sighs> at the moment, I can only think in kind of minute ways of dealing with it on the day-to-day -the -day, rather than... Um, an immediate strategy. I can only think of kind of ways forward, but hopefully that's the beginning. Um, I know there are questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, apologies for that. If you want to come find us, please come find us. Um, our, I'll, I'll put our emails up one more time so you can note them down if you haven't already. And yeah, thank you for having us. And thank you for all your good points.